From trucks that promised muscle but couldn't haul their own weight to luxury experiments that missed the mark entirely. Here are some of the worst pickup trucks that nobody expected. The 1972 Ford Courier, a truck that, well, didn't exactly make it to the Hall of Fame of pickups. Picture this. Ford, seeing how everyone's going crazy for those small Toyota and Nissan trucks, decides they want in on the action. So they team up with Mazda to create the Ford Courier. Sounds like a good plan, right? Well, not exactly. Let's break down why this truck is often remembered for all the wrong reasons. First off, the looks and what's under the hood, or should I say, what's falling apart under there. Right from the get-go, the Courier was kind of like that project you start with all the enthusiasm in the world and then it just doesn't pan out. People noticed it looked a bit off and wasn't exactly holding together well, either on the inside or outside. We're talking a real lack of that durability vibe you want in a truck. Now about the power, or the lack thereof. This truck came with a 1.8 liter engine pushing out a whopping 74 horsepower. Yeah, you heard that right. While it might have been okay back in the day, it just couldn't hang with the other trucks on the block. It was like showing up to a marathon with one shoe. You're not going to get very far. And then there's the practicality issue. For a pickup, you'd expect it to carry, well, your pickups, right? But with a payload capacity of just 1,400 pounds, it wasn't going to be hauling much. This was a big miss for anyone looking for a truck to do truck things. Talking about bang for your buck, the courier rolled onto the scene with a price tag of just over $3,000. Now, while that might not sound too bad, when you stack up all its issues, poor design, lack of power, falling apart at the seams, it just didn't add up to a good deal, especially when there were better options out there for the same dough. So, wrapping this up, the 1972 Ford Courier was kind of a misfire on Ford's part. It was their answer to the small pickup craze, but it just didn't deliver. 1999 Chevy Silverado Now, while it's been a top seller in the U.S., it's not without its fair share of headaches. Let's break it down, and I'll keep it super straightforward for you. First up, the fuel system. It's been a bit of a troublemaker. From guzzling gas like there's no tomorrow to engine hiccups and even some safety concerns, this issue is a big deal, especially for a truck that's supposed to handle the heavy lifting and long road trips with ease. Now, let's talk looks and longevity specifically the body and paint. Imagine your Silverado starting to rust, the paint peeling off or dealing with body damage. Not a pretty picture, right? Besides losing some serious curb appeal, these problems could lead to bigger structural nightmares down the line. Electrical gremlins? The top 99 Silverados got them. Whether it's flickering lights, starting troubles, or haywire electronic controls, these electrical woes can be a real pain to sort out not to mention hitting your wallet hard when it comes to repairs. But hey, it's not all doom and gloom. The Silverado comes with some serious muscle under the hood and plenty of room to stretch out inside. It's just that these perks might get overshadowed by the issues we talked about. 2002, Lincoln Blackwood. Lincoln's ambitious leap into the luxury pickup truck market that, well, didn't exactly land as they hoped. Picture this. You've got the luxury of a Lincoln Navigator, mashed together with the body of a Ford F-150, sporting some sleek Navigator taillights. Sounds cool, right? Lincoln thought so too, and marketed this beauty as the ultimate luxury truck. But here's where things start to unravel. First off, there was a bit of an identity crisis. Imagine a truck that looks fancy but doesn't quite fit the bill when it comes to what truck users actually need. It's like showing up to a campsite with a tent that looks amazing but leaks at the first sign of rain. Then there's the issue of versatility. The Blackwoods said no thanks to four-wheel drive, sticking to rear drive only. Not exactly what you want for off-roading or towing your boat to the lake. The cargo space? More like a lack thereof. The Blackwoods' trunk, and yes, they called it a trunk, was a cramped 27 cubic feet. That's tiny compared to other trucks making it a tough sell for anyone needing to haul, well, anything substantial. Now let's talk about that cargo bed. Carpeted with a fancy-powered tonneau cover and LED lighting, it was more suited for a fashion show runway than hauling anything remotely dirty or heavy. Style over substance, it seems. And the price tag? 
a whopping $52,500. That's a lot of dough, especially for a truck that's not as useful as its less pricey counterparts. This hefty price, combined with the Blackwood's limitations, made it a tough pill for buyers to swallow. Production was short-lived only a single year, hinting that Lincoln's experiment didn't quite pan out as they'd hoped. Its rarity now makes it a bit of a collector's item, but also means it's less known and less loved than other trucks out there. The Blackwood's reception was, let's say, mixed. Some folks loved its unique style and luxury touches, but many others couldn't get past its high price and limited practicality. It even earned a spot on Autoblog's list of the dumbest cars of all time, which is, well, not exactly a badge of honor. The 1978 Subaru Brat, a vehicle that really tried to blur the lines between a car and a pickup truck. The Brat, standing for Bi-Drive Recreational All-Terrain Transporter, was a bold attempt by Subaru to create something unique. But despite its innovative spirit, it ran into a few bumps along the road. First off, the Brat was based on the Subaru Leone station wagon, not a purpose-built truck chassis. This meant that while it looked cool and was pretty handy for light-duty tasks, it didn't quite match up to the beefiness or the carrying capacity you'd expect from a traditional pickup. Under the hood, it wasn't exactly a powerhouse either. The early models came with a 1.6-liter engine churning out just 67 horsepower, which wasn't going to set any speed records. Then, there's the safety aspect. One of the Brat's quirky features was its rear-facing jump seats in the cargo bed. Sure, it was a novel idea, and it might have been fun to ride in those seats, but in terms of safety, it was a bit of a head-scratcher. If you were sitting back there, you were pretty much exposed to the elements and didn't have much in the way of protection if things went sideways. Another interesting tidbit about the Brat was how Subaru navigated around the chicken tax, a hefty 25% import tariff on light trucks in the U.S., they ingeniously installed those rear jump seats to classify the Brat as a passenger car, dodging the tax. While it was a clever move, it did raise a few eyebrows regarding its integrity. Despite its uniqueness and the cool factor of being different, the Brat didn't quite catch on everywhere. It wasn't even sold in Japan, its country of origin due to lack of interest. In the U.S., its journey came to an end in 1987. The Brat had its fans, thanks to its distinctive character and off-road capabilities, but it couldn't broaden its appeal to the wider market. 1976. Cadillac Mirage Pickup Truck A ride that tried to mash up Cadillac luxury with pickup truck ruggedness. Brought to life by traditional coachworks of California, the Mirage was, well, more of a Mirage when it came to delivering on both fronts. Let me walk you through why this vehicle ended up on the not-so-great list of pickups. First off, the Mirage started life as a Cadillac Coupe de Ville. The folks at Traditional Coachworks took it, chopped it up, and stretched it out to fit a pickup bed on the back. Sounds cool, right? Well, while it definitely turned heads with its unique style, the Mirage's utility was a bit of a letdown. Powered by a hefty 8.2-liter V8 engine, you'd think it had power to spare. But with only 200 horsepower, and 400 pound-feet of torque, it wasn't exactly the king of the haul. Fine for cruising around town, but if you were thinking of lugging heavy loads, not so much. Now on to the price tag. Converting a luxury Coupe de Ville into a pickup wasn't cheap, and the Mirage's price was twice what you'd pay for the Coupe itself. This steep cost put it out of reach for most folks, making it more of a luxury statement than a practical purchase. Let's talk numbers. The Mirage had a really short production run from 1975 to 1976, and it's estimated that maybe up to 240 of these were ever made. Its rarity could have been a cool factor, but it also meant there weren't many to go around for interested buyers. If you're thinking of restoring a Mirage, good luck. Finding specific body parts is like searching for a needle in a haystack since it's not like there's a surplus of scrapped Mirages or aftermarket parts lying around. This rarity makes maintenance and restoration a real headache, potentially dimming its allure and value over time. And here's the kicker. Despite being sold at Cadillac dealerships, General Motors didn't officially give it their blessing. The Mirage was more of a dealership novelty than a GM-endorsed product, which might have dented its reputation and appeal right from the start. 